All right, welcome back class. Trust that you all had a nice spring break. Um, hopefully you all got to relax a little bit. Today we're gonna continue on in the discussion we started a few lectures ago, considering systems driven far from equilibrium. Relaxing the assumptions that we've made previously about perturbations being small and rather envisioning perturbations being large, rapidly varying in time and carrying an initially equilibrium system far off of the manifold of states with their associated Boltzmann distribution of weights. So what we first tried to do is to understand the structure of systems away from equilibrium. And what we found was that it was useful to consider systems within the perspective of path ensembles. So today we're going to carry that understanding through, identify a couple more results uh, regarding the symmetries of path ensembles and path partition functions, so sums over paths. And at the end, we'll actually show how we can leverage this structure, the symmetries associated with path ensembles to actually make generalizations of response theories away from linear response or around non-equilibrium steady states. So we'll further develop through the use of path ensembles, a non-linear or non-equilibrium response theory. That'll be our kind of goal by the end of the lecture. But before we get there, let's remind ourselves of a couple of the things that we've uncovered recently. So we have taken a perspective of path ensembles and particularly we have identified a trajectory as a fundamental object for which we wanted to associate a probability of observing. So we have defined a trajectory of a system that exists over a domain in time t as a vector of the configurations of the system from some initial configuration x naught through some discretization x of delta t, x of two delta t, all the way up to x of t. So that's what we mean by a trajectory. It's the time ordered sequence of configurations a system visits along some path. There is an infinite number of configurations as we take the discretization to zero, but for, for some finite discretization, there's some countable number of configurations. For the sorts of stochastic dynamics that we have built up, things like our Langevin equation, we can associate the probability of observing that particular trajectory to the probability of drawing just the right set of random noises, random actions of the path that will push us along that path. So specifically, if I imagine that this system is evolving with an underdamped Langevin equation or overdamped Langevin equation, with some deterministic force F, some random force eta from the bath, 
and some friction due to the bath gamma, such that the random force and frictions are balanced through the fluctuation dissipation relationship. The so-called Ansager Machlup form for the probability of observing x of t, the trajectory given some initial condition is equal to up to a constant proportionality an integral over time and just the likelihood that I drew those specific Gaussian random variables, which I can eliminate eta through the equation of motion and write like so. we would associate the argument of that exponential as the Ansager Machlup action. Essentially the log likelihood of observing that particular trajectory. And not surprisingly, given the random numbers, the random actions of the bath, which generate a spread of trajectories are Gaussian distributed, the functional of the trajectory, the action of the trajectory that tells us its likelihood is also Gaussian. So that's the basic elements. We know how to assign a probability to a trajectory, our kind of fundamental object we're considering in systems far away from equilibrium are trajectories. And we have found both through an explicit calculation most recently and argued from somewhat general perspectives that this path ensemble contains some fundamental symmetries reflective of the second law of thermodynamics. So for example, from Crookes, the probability of observing a trajectory in the forward direction of time relative to seeing that trajectory in the opposite order. So not beginning at X naught, seeing X of delta T all the way up to X of delta x of t, but rather starting at x t, seeing x of t less delta t all the way back to x naught, that's the trajectory in the reverse direction of time, that this is equal to beta times the heat that is released over the course of the trajectory in the forward direction of time. And owing to the fact that our Langevin description assumes that there are some bath degrees of freedom that are fast to relax and always at equilibrium with some temperature T or inverse temperature beta, the probability of observing the trajectory in the forward or reverse direction of time is just given by the heat released into that bath weighted by its equilibrium temperature. So this is the so-called Crookes fluctuation theorem. It tells us that the extent of time reversal symmetry breaking is given by the extent of dissipation, the amount of heat released to the environment. And we have argued that from this result, it is straightforward to derive the so-called Jarzinski equality. Noting that the first law gives us a relationship between the change in the energy of the system, the heat and the work. One can arrive at an equality for the exponential average of the amount of work over the course of trajectory in a case where I am actively perturbing the system, driving it with some external perturbation 
that if I average over many realizations of those trajectories, the work that I do over the course of those trajectories, I can recover the equilibrium free energy difference between the states that I start and end in. So independent of how rapidly I drive the system between some initial and final set of states, in, independent of whether or not I leave an equilibrium manifold of states in between, the underlying microscopic reversibility of the dynamics ensures that if I do the accounting of the energy, that I can recover a statement of equilibrium thermodynamics, namely the free energy difference, as an exponential average of the work. Okay, so that's a bit of review. Those are results that we've seen. I wanna say a couple more words about the structure of path ensembles and a few related symmetries that follow more or less directly from the Crookes fluctuation theorem. So this one way to rearrange the Crookes fluctuation theorem would be to take the exponent, the logarithm on both sides, and I'd find that the beta times the heat is equal to the log ratio of the path probabilities in the forward and reverse directions of time. Now, again, because the bath stays at equilibrium by construction, it's heat, the heat released into the bath divided by its thermodynamic temperature, thus tells us about the entropy change over the course of that trajectory. That's just a usual thermodynamic relationship that S is equal to Q, more specifically delta S is equal to Q over T. Indeed, one could start with a, the definition of our trajectory ensemble into microscopic updates, microscopic transitions, take the log likelihood of that measure P log P would give us a usual definition of the entropy taking a time derivative would give us the entropy production. Integrating that, we would indeed find the same definition of the entropy along a trajectory. So there is a mechanical way of thinking about this time reversal symmetry breaking in terms of an energy released to the bath or a thermodynamic interpretation in terms of the entropy generated over the course of that trajectory. If we thought about the entropy directly, let P of S be the probability of producing some amount of entropy over the trajectory of length T. 
I can compute that probability distribution as an integral over all paths, the likelihood of seeing that particular path and average a delta function, the dummy variable that tells me the value of the entropy is S and it must be equal to that log likelihood of the ratio of forward and reverse trajectories by its definition. That's a means of computing the average or what the entropy production is over an individual trajectory as we've just argued. I can choose to integrate over all paths in the forward direction of time or the reverse. Those have the same measure. So I can do a change of variables. There are the same number of paths in the forward and backward direction, so there's no Jacobian. But the symmetry of those paths tells me through crooks, this relationship here at the top, that when I go between the forward and reverse directions, the likelihood of observing an individual path changes by an amount e to the delta s. Let's just define delta, sorry about that. Let's just define s as its change. So I have a reference, which is zero. Now note if I do a change of variables, I'll now have S plus log PX, like so. Now, entropy generation is odd under time reversal. So if I change the argument of that exponential to be an integrated over the reverse direction, that carries a minus sign associated with it. This implies that the average entropy production, sorry, this should still be a, that should be a minus sign. This implies that the, I can do an averaging operation over all those reverse paths. That ensures that I pick out where S is, you know, a specific value of S, which is it's negative. And what I average is that exponential. The delta function like, lets me take that exponential outside. So I get a measure of the number of ways that I can generate a specific amount of entropy S weighted by E to the positive value of S because this is equal to And I flip this around, it's negative. So the log ratio or the relative ratio of generating some positive amount of entropy to generating some negative amount of entropy is exponentially suppressed in the extent of the entropy. It is exponentially unlikely to destroy entropy relative to create it. Again, that's another statement of just the second law, but this is known as the so-called fluctuation theorem for the entropy production.
an alternative way to characterize those statistics of entropy production would not be to consider the likelihood of creating or destroying some amount of entropy, but rather by through its probability, but rather to consider it through its cumulant generating function. Let's define a Z of lambda as the moment generating function, the exponential average of e to the minus lambda s, such that if I took derivatives of z of lambda with respect to lambda, I will generate moments of z, an alternative way of characterizing entropy production fluctuations, where this average, our averages over paths. Indeed, if we roll that out, the fluctuating quantity is just S. So I can write that average over all paths that give me some amount of entropy, the likelihood that that particular amount of entropy was generated and the thing that I'm averaging. So again, as a cumulant generating function, if I was to take derivatives of log of z with respect to lambda, evaluate lambda is equal to zero, I would get information about the cumulants of the entropy. From that fluctuation theorem symmetry, it should be clear that there will be a symmetry associated with this generating function. Indeed, if I average over not positive s, the probability of observing some positive s, but rather it's negative by knowing how those probabilities are related through the fluctuation theorem. That they are exponentially suppressed. Grouping those exponentials, the arguments of those exponentials, it looks like I've just renamed my fluctuating, my constant variable lambda. So that then is exactly equal to that cumulant generating function evaluated at one less lambda. And so I found a symmetry about lambda for the generating function associated with entropy production fluctuations, a reflection symmetry about lambda is equal to one half. This is known as the so-called Galavati-Cohen symmetry. When it was first derived for deterministic dynamics or Leibowitz spoon symmetry who first derived it for stochastic dynamics. And is essentially the same sort of statement as what we found before with the Crookes fluctuation theorem that the underlying microscopic reversibility of the dynamics endows measures of path statistics 
with symmetries. We have previously discussed symmetries associated with the likelihood of observing a trajectory or a measure over that trajectory, like its work, heat, entropy. An alternative to characterizing the fluctuations through its distribution would be to characterize it through its moments or cumulants. And that symmetry then is endowed now as a symmetry in the counting parameter lambda. To understand this notion of entropy production, entropy production fluctuations, and why it should have this sort of form, why, you know, what's the structure of this cumulant generating function. We can actually make some analogies with these generating functions over path ensembles and our usual partition functions that we consider in equilibrium statistical mechanics. So specifically, this object here is like a path partition function. It's an integral over all the paths. It sums up all of their weights. And so it counts the number of trajectories in this case that generate some amount of entropy. Let's understand that structure a little bit more. So the entropy, we can imagine that as a time extensive variable, we could break it up into individual chunks that are independent. So let's write the entropy as a sum over little omegas. the entropy produced over some amount of time, call it tau, where T over tau is equal to N. And let's assume that tau is large enough that each subsequent omega is independent. So the entropy can be decomposed into a sum over independent random variables, the amount of entropy produced over some time. If that is true, if we can decompose the entropy in such blocks, essentially making an assumption that the correlation times associated with the trajectory that we're interested in are finite, then we can compute that generating function in a particularly simple way. So specifically, e to the minus lambda s average by definition is then just e to the minus lambda w1 times e to the minus lambda w2 all the way to e to the minus lambda wn. If each of those are statistically independent, I can average them separately. 
get a product of averaged exponentials. I factorize that expectation value. And if they're statistically identical, <clears throat> in, in addition, excuse me. <clears throat> if they're statistically identical, in addition to being statistically independent, then that total <clears throat> generating function is just given by n factors like so, reminding ourselves what n means. <laughs> No, oh, excuse me. I can rewrite this. Like so. And thus I found that there is an exponential dependence on time for that generating function, defining everything inside here as e to some psi of lambda, that cumulant generating function has a form of just t times psi of lambda. This should look a little bit familiar. This is a so-called large deviation form. It is telling us that the generating function for fluctuations in the entropy provided the have finite time correlations has a particular dependence on time, namely it is exponentially large or small, depending on the sign of psi, in that time. So there's a time intensive variable, psi of lambda, that encodes all of the long time statistics of the entropy. This should look just like what we discuss in introductory statistical mechanics. Like what we find when we think about just regular old configurational partition functions. Specifically, if we were thinking about the canonical ensemble, something parameterized by beta and equal to a sum over configurations, some Boltzmann weight associated with those configurations, we know for thermodynamic consistency that that partition function is equal to e to the minus beta, some function of beta and in principle n, as well as v, in this case, the Helmholtz free energy. And we know that if n is large, so in the thermodynamic limit, the Helmholtz free energy becomes independent of n. And thus one can define any Helmholtz energy density for which the partition function is exponentially small in times the characteristic size of the system given by n. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
So normal partition functions similarly take on this large deviation form, but not in time. Time is irrelevant in thermodynamic equilibrium, rather in system size. So the relevant thermodynamic limit, the, red, the relevant large limit, large scaling limit, is the number of particles in a configurational partition function in equilibrium calculation. Whereas for these path partition functions, the scaling limit, the equivalence to the thermodynamic limit is a long time limit, long compared to the characteristic correlation times. And in those limits, we recover a large deviation form with an object here, psi of lambda, which is playing the same role as the partition function does in equilibrium. It's a measure of the number of, in this case, trajectories with a given weight. We can see a, a no, another relationship between equilibrium partition functions and these path partition functions by noticing that the cumulant generating function, if I go all the way back here, through this relationship, can be thought of as a Laplace transform of the probability of seeing some amount of entropy, which means that I could recover the probability of that amount of entropy by doing an inverse Laplace transform. So rewriting that. So that means that if I know Z of lambda, I also know P of S through an inverse Laplace transform. How are inverse Laplace transforms defined? They're defined over a contour uh, L integration over that Laplace variable lambda factors of two pi and I. And now E to the plus lambda S. We have just argued that in the scaling limit, Z of lambda in the large time limit, Z of lambda will have this large deviation form. So plugging that in. We can look at the intensive S. some lowercase s, which is the capital entropy s divided by t, and thus group lambda psi of lambda plus lambda s, factoring out the common scale, the length of the trajectory t, and in the long time limit, we can evaluate this inverse Laplace transform through a saddle point. The exponential will be dominated by its maximum value. So a way to evaluate it would be to just extremize 
this argument of the exponential. So its maximum is given by where the derivative with respect to lambda of that argument is zero. To find some lambda star, which is going to depend on s. Factoring that out, we find that the derivative of psi of lambda must be equal to minus s at that lambda star. Or inserting that back in, P of S is equal to asymptotically through the saddle point evaluation T psi of lambda star plus lambda star s. Or defining all of that factored out of, factored out from time as i the minus of s, p of s we find is exponentially suppressed in time by a function i of s, which is known as the rate function. And it is the complement to psi of lambda. It is the large deviation scaling form that encodes the log likelihood of the probability of generating some amount of entropy in this case. So I of S, what we've just found was a extremum over lambda of psi of lambda plus lambda s. So that is a Legendre transform which is the exponential complement of the Laplace transform and should ring some bells. You probably observed Legendre transforms before in thermodynamics as we go between different auxiliary variables. So the Helmholtz free energy is a Legendre transform of the energy. It has a microscopic interpretation as the difference between the microcanonical and canonical ensembles through a relationship encoded by a Laplace transform. So what we found here is that that structure that we learned in thermodynamics is completely recovered in ensembles of paths in the right scaling limits that play the equivalent role as the thermodynamic limit in a configurational ensemble. Namely, there are functions that encode the numbers of paths, normalizations over path ensembles. Those are path partition functions. They have large deviation scalings and the long time limit that are equivalent to cumulant generating functions and look a lot like 
free energies in configurational ensembles. And those free energies are related to entropies. In this case, just the probability of observing some amount of entropy, also known as rate functions through Legendre transforms. So all this structure is independent of the details of what ensemble or what thing you're summing over and are just underpinned by some basic notions of statistics and correlations. Okay, that all got a bit abstract. Let's actually employ this structure for something useful. So let's see how this structure lets us talk about nonlinear response theory or responses around non-equilibrium steady states. So let's imagine taking a system that is open in contact with an environment at some temperature T so that it can exchange energy. And I want to take that system and add to it some constant force F that will drive currents flowing through the system. Some constant applied force that might be a body force, might generate a flow, might be an electric field, coupled to charges in that system. Something that will generate persistent currents, generate a non-equilibrium steady state. But I imagine that those fluctuations are thermalized by their contact with the bath, even though they might be taken far away from equilibrium. There's still an energy reservoir, which will allow me to develop a steady state, given I'm inserting or injecting a constant supply of energy through this applied force. So here we have some reference system that evolves with some dynamics without any knowledge of F. And here we have a dynamics that knows about that application of F. So the trajectories now follow different paths. Their likelihood of observing those trajectories are now different because there are new applied forces that alter those trajectories. We can ask a very simple question. What is the probability of observing an individual trajectory in the presence or absence of F? Moreover, if I have the probability of a trajectory, I can use that probability, if I know how they're related, to compute any arbitrary expectation value. So imagine I wanted to average some obs observable O and ask how are averages of O in the presence of F or in its absence related. Well, this is now actually straightforward given the structure we've developed without approximation, the average of O in the presence of F, 
is equal to an integral over paths if O is some path observable that operator times the probability that I observe in those individual trajectories that contain knowledge of that external force. Now, provided there are the same number of paths in a system with or without, with, with or without F, which is the case for a system that is in contact with a heat bath described by a Langevin equation or any equivalent stochastic equation of motion, the observable doesn't change. I can multiply and divide by the probability of observing those paths in the absence of F. And let's define that ratio of probabilities as some e to the beta delta u of F. The change of measure and what I find then by Definition is that averages in the presence of the external force are equal to averages in the absence of that external force weighted by the log like the exponential of the log likelihood of observing a path in the presence or absence of F. So you therefore is a change in the stochastic action, a change in the likelihood of seeing individual trajectories given that force is present. Now, this should look very familiar. If you reach your mind all the way back to some of those first lectures where we were talking about generalizations of response theory in an equilibrium configurational system, a system where we were per perturbing in such a way that we went between one equilibrium system and asked questions about how that was related to another equilibrium system we arrived at results exactly like this, except for this exponential was not an exponential that contains knowledge of the dynamics of the system. Rather, it was a weighting factor that told me how one equilibrium probability of configurations were related to another equilibrium probability of configurations. Here, we have found the exact same sort of structure, but that weighting factor is now a function over the whole path. It contains information of how, about how the likelihoods of trajectories change given this perturbation. To understand what this delta F must look like, let's decompose it based on its Symmetries under time reversal. So we know that if we took delta U of F in the forward direction of time and subtracted it off subtracted off its time reverse, that that is a difference in the likelihood of observing a trajectory in the forward or reverse direction of time, that must be equal to the entropy production over the course of that forward trajectory. 
or more specifically, the excess entropy production due to F. It's what we mean by entropy on a microscopic dynamic, from a microscopic dynamical perspective. That is not sufficient to define delta U. In general, delta U has a time reversal asymmetric piece, which we've just identified as entropy production. But in addition, there's some time reversal symmetric piece. Let A subscript F be that additional piece. Now with those two individual pieces, the entropy production and this time reversal symmetric piece, often called the activity, the dynamical activity, we have then a unique, or not a unique, but a decomposition of that relative stochastic action. It's particularly useful if, for example, we wanted to understand how these averages are related to each other at some order in F. So let's actually imagine that F is small, such that we can expand this relationship here. So this is exact. If F is small, some arbitrary observable O will be given by a Taylor expansion at zero orders, just O in that reference ensemble at first order will be beta F O times how this delta U depends on beta F. That's the complete first order correction. The second order correction has two terms. How O correlates with a second derivative of delta U of F plus that first derivative quantity squared. <laughs> 
And we could develop that to arbitrary order. So we find that the change in O on average has contributions from, in general, both pieces inserting delta F through one half S plus A. we would find that to first order, we have beta F average of O times D S D beta F. plus O D A D beta F. Those are the two <clears throat> first order corrections. The second order corrections have correlations between O and a second derivative with respect to beta F of S plus correlations between O and a second derivative of A, <clears throat> excuse me, with respect to beta F. plus a mixed term O first derivative of S first derivative of A, pick up two of those. So we find that dynamically we can develop a response theory to arbitrary order by thinking about how O is correlated with both the entropy production as well as this time reversal symmetric quantity, the activity. And we can go to arbitrary order and things get pretty complicated because that weighting factor in general will contain terms from both factors and thus cross terms that correlate all three functions. O, S, and A. But there's some real simplification here. If, for example, O is itself a time reversal asymmetric quantity, if O is odd, under time reversal, Remember, these are all equilibrium averages, averages in the absence of F. An equilibrium average is overall time reversal symmetric. So if we took this and specified that O is odd under time reversal and that equilibrium average have to be overall even, well, by construction, the entropy is odd. So times O is odd overall, two, time, two odds are even. So that term would persist. But the second term, term that would correlate an odd variable O with an even variable in time, A goes away in equilibrium. That dynamical activity plays no role at first order, even for a dynamical variable. <clears throat> 
like O. Simplifying further, S is uh, <clears throat> S is odd. A is still even at higher order. This term would go away. The second derivative of A of S, typically S is proportional to F. So this term would go away. And at second order, we would just have correlations, triplets of correlations between this time reversal asymmetric quantity, the entropy reduction, and now the dynamical activity. So appealing to time reversal symmetry arguments, we find first order response is just given by something thermodynamic, the entropy reduction, but higher order response depends intrinsically on dynamics through this dynamical activity. That's still a little bit abstract. To make this concrete, let's consider a specific system. Let's consider a particle moving in a ratchet potential. <clears throat> so let's put a particle down here. And it's being imagined that we can pull it with some force F. Now, if F is small, the displacement of that particle is going to be symmetric in the sense of if I plot the displacement x of t less x on average as a function of f. Well, for small f's, the mobility of that particle as dictated by time reversal symmetry is going to be independent of the sine of f. I get the same amount of current in the forward direction as I would get in the reverse direction. But if I drive that system further out of equilibrium, the fact that it is more gently sloping over to the right than it is over to the left means that this particle can actually rectify current. It'll be easier to push it in the positive direction of x than it is in the negative direction of x. So linear response doesn't have a directionality, but nonlinear response might. And let's imagine this is just some Brownian particle and a so-called ratchet potential. So if it's a Brownian particle, we know it's equation of motion. Like so, where this capital F is minus the gradient of the potential. And eta fluctuations from the bath obey a fluctuation dissipation symmetry or theorem. With that concrete stochastic action, we can now work out this response of the current 
the displacement of the particle to this applied force F and ask about non, uh, arbitrarily nonlinear responses, in which case we actually could see, for example, this ratchet behavior, this ability to rectify current in one direction. So from our Ansager Machlup action, the probability of observing a trajectory in this system is proportional to e to the minus beta, an integral over time, like so. The associated, so this is the stochastic action U in the presence of the force. The associated action in the absence of the force is similarly e easy to write so that delta U of F with a beta is equal to beta times the integral over time, a term that is proportional to f times x dot over two, a term that is equal to f times the deterministic force over two gamma, and a constant f squared over four gamma. That's just by working out the non-vanishing cross terms of u of f less u of zero. So the time reversal symmetric or asymmetric quantity, the entropy production, is that term proportional to x dot. So these other quantities must be equal to the time symmetric component, but note the second quantity is just a constant, so it can't actually determine anything important. So we can define that multiplication of f times the deterministic force as the symmetric part of the action. So specifically, S of F is equal to, F is just a constant. I can even pull it out of the integral as is two X dot, which is, in fact, f by two x less x naught, that is the current that we're interested in. Indeed, generally, the entropy production will be a force times a displacement times a current. The dynamical activity negative f by two gamma, the force over time, not so simple to evaluate. If we are interested in j, a function of time in the presence of f from our response theory above if f is small we now just need to put in those f's 
those a of f's and s of f's into this equation here. So to first order, I will correlate the observable I'm interested in with the derivative with respect to beta f of s. I guess I have defined those with betas. So that first order derivative beta f by two is just a current. So I get a current current squared. That's a current squared, a current times a current, that's a current squared. That if we unravel it into our individual integrals over time, we'll see in just a second, it's just the normal old green Kubo expression. And that is indeed what we would find to first order. To second order, however, so there's not a second derivative of s, but to second order, my theory here tells you that you correlate the observable you're interested in, that's the current, with the derivative of the entropy production with respect to f, that's the current again. So I'll have two factors of the current and this time symmetric variable. So we find something fundamentally kinetic coming in at second order response or the nonlinear response theory in terms of time correlation functions. the current in the presence of the force is equal to beta F unraveling those J's, two time integrals, X dot at one time, X dot at another time. Indeed, that's the green Kubo expression for the mobility of the particle. We recover that. But now at higher order, we get a three time integral, gross. And a correlation between the velocity of the particle at T prime, the velocity of the particle at T double prime, and the force due to the deterministic part of the potential at a final time. In the long time limit, we expect to develop a steady state. So the long time limit J should be proportional to T. And so the long time limit of J divided by T is the rate of change in J. That really is the current, not the displacement. So that current is a function of F invoking time reversal symmetry of these equilibrium correlation functions. To first order, we recover exactly now the green Kubo expression. And again, from time reversal invariance of the equilibrium correlation functions, we now can change this two time integral or three time integral into a two time integral. But we still correlate now the deterministic force with the current squared. So how does this give us insight into the rectification behavior of this little ratchet? 
So it says that the nonlinear response correlates a fluctuation in the displacement. So it could be to the right or to the left, it's unsigned with the force. So on one side, the force is very small, it's gradual, and thus I subtract off a smaller number from the mobility, from that integral. On the left, I correlate the squared displacement, the unsigned displacement with the force to the right or to the left, and that force is very large. So I subtract off a much larger number. So just by interrogating, so if we bring this picture over to our equations, by interrogating the form of this generalized dynamical response theory, how those unsigned displacements, current squared, correlates with the intrinsic force that the particle feels in the absence of the additional external force, I can predict then which direction this ratchet behavior is likely to evolve in, which is the direction of the increasing current as I increase the force ever more, as I drive this particle arbitrarily far from equilibrium. And another important lesson is that this response is fundamentally dynamical. We see that in at first order, apart from a, a measure of the dynamics, well, this is to say that the first order response, if we go back to our theory here, first order response is fundamentally thermodynamic in the sense that it correlates some variable with an entropy production. So I ask for the cost of generating that displacement energetically, and I know how then the system is going to respond. Higher order responses, however, correlate time reversal symmetric quantities. Time reversal symmetric quantities necessarily encode dynamic information. We can kind of see the reflection of that here by the persistence of gamma, a intrinsically dynamical parameter entering in into the expression, not just energetic quantities like the temperature, and the applied mechanical force. So this is a way by thinking about path ensembles and path partition functions of going beyond linear response for dynamical systems. And what you learn, an important rule, I think an important observation is that it's really the conjugate variables in a dynamical sense that are important for nonlinear responses, not just in a mechanical or thermodynamic sense. So while F times the displacement would tell me the energetic cost of creating this response, that is insufficient to encode the dynamical response away from linear order, away from an equilibrium state. I need to really think about how F, what F is conjugated to in the dynamics of the system, in this case, in the stochastic action, the likelihood of generating a specific path, we find that F is conjugate to a sum of symmetric and asymmetric quantities. So this initial decomposition, this idea to, to think about response theory by decomposing the action into symmetric and asymmetric quantities, that was the identification of the importance of the asymmetric quantity was originally done by Mays. Christian Mays is a Belgium. And this observation that you can use that decomposition into a formal response theory valid at higher order and done within the language of large deviation theory, that was done by Gao. Uh, Berkeley student 
uh, here in the chemistry department. All right, so that's all I want to talk about for today. In the next couple lectures, we'll be continuing on in our discussion of rare dynamical fluctuations, but now moving our attention more to studies of chemical kinetics and barrier crossings. So stay tuned for that, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the small groups.